Hello and welcome to today's Digital Scholar webinar. My name is Katja Reuter, and today we will uh, take a look at how crowdsourcing can benefit your research. So to what extent can crowdsourcing provide a mechanism for finding collaborators and carrying out research projects? So our topic today is crowdsourcing applied to knowledge management in translational research. So let's take a moment and define crowdsourcing. In a nutshell, crowdsourcing involves the engagement of large communities, so large numbers of individuals, and they all work together to accomplish a task at, at massive scale. So these could be online or offline, paid or for free. And today, we will look at two projects. The first one is the Gene Wiki project. The goal of this project is to create a scientific knowledge base that is actually maintained by a community of informatics researchers from a wide range of disciplines. And Andrew, um, our speaker today, will tell you more about that. And the second project is Mark to Cure project. Um, this is a project that partners with citizen scientists to extract content from scientific abstracts with an emphasis on rare diseases. So we hope that after today's webinar, you will be able to understand the concept of crowdsourcing for research purposes. And you will be able to describe how crowdsourcing projects can aid in organizing biomedical information. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrew Su to you. Um, he's professor at the Scripps Research Institute and director of bioinformatics at the Scripps Research Translational Institute. And Andrew will be joined by two citizen scientists, Celine and Tom Adams. As always, we will have time for your questions at the end of the presentation. At any time, you can add them to the Q&A panel which you can find on the right side of the webinar. So thank you so much for joining us. Andrew, please take it from here. Great, and I think I've just shared my screen. Fantastic. So thank you uh, for that introduction, Katya, and um, looking forward to this presentation. Uh, Katya, I'm gonna ask you to, to focus um, a little bit uh, more on, on the uh, aspect of the methodological aspects of crowdsourcing. So I am going to uh, hit that a little bit in a little bit more detail than I usually do. But nevertheless, I do want to start by introducing what we are applying crowdsourcing to, uh, this concept of, of knowledge management in biology. Um, so I want to illustrate this by um, an example. And let's see, my slide advance. Okay, um, and I want to start with two case studies in rare diseases. Um, this is actually um, Alexis and Noah Beery. They've been very um, public with, with their, uh, their family's diseases. Uh, so this is uh, their frater uh, Alexis and Noah Beery, who are fraternal uh, twins. And when they were younger, they presented with uh, many developmental disorders, seizures and coordination problems and, and things like this. And um, initially they were diagnosed with a disorder um, called uh, dopamine responsive dystonia. And dopamine responsive dystonia, essentially this is a little biochemical pathway. And um, the, there we go, the, Presumed mutation is in this uh, gene called tyrosine hydroxylase. And therefore, the treatment for that is uh, so the mutation is in tyrosine hydroxylase, which inhibits production of dopamine. And so the treatment is to, uh, to give patients L dopa um, to overcome the effect of that mutation. And for a long time, this uh, greatly improved uh, uh, the twins' uh, symptoms and they lived by and large uh, normal lives. Um, however, in their, in their teenage years, they started developing some, some really quite severe um, uh, symptoms. And so it's at that time where genome sequencing really came, uh, became much more common. And so they both had their, their genome sequences together uh, with their, their parents, and what they discovered is that actually their uh, mutation was in a, a different uh, gene. It was actually in this SPR gene for sepiapterin reductase. And in response to that genetic diagnosis, they actually uh, supplemented that uh, L-DOPA treatment with 5-hydroxytryptophan, uh, which is actually an over-the-counter 
uh, supplement uh, you can buy in, in health food stores. And within weeks of taking, of adding 5-HPP to their, um, to their, their diets, uh, the, the twins essentially were, were essentially asymptomatic. Uh, this was a picture of the twins taken uh, several years ago, right as they were both heading off to college um, and, and both, again, by and large, leading quite, quite normal and, and, and successful lives. So, so that's uh, case study number one. Uh, case number 92 here is uh, actually the, the mite family. Um, so um, Bertrand, who you'll see on the far right, uh, is the oldest child. And, and, and as he was uh, growing up, they also noticed many symptoms, uh, similar symptoms uh, that are characteristic of many developmental disorders. So um, uh, had issues with movements, um, had seizures, uh, had a lacrima, which is sort of a, one characteristic of this disease, the, the inability to produce tears, um, uh, things like that. And they too had their uh, genome sequence, Bertrand and his parents. And what they discovered is that Bertrand's mutation was in this uh, gene that codes for a protein called N-glycanase. Uh, N-glycanase is, um, is a protein that cleaves N-linked glycans from unfolded proteins that allow them to be degraded by the proteasome. Um, when that is dysfunctional, what happens um, is that you have accumulation of these unfolded proteins, aggregates that are presumed to be uh, then to lead to some sort of toxicity. But this, in contrast to case study number one, uh, for case number two, in uh, despite knowing the mutation, uh, there is no obvious treatment that's available, um, uh, currently known for environmental deficiency. And it begs the question of why, right? What separates case study one from case study number two? And um, I, I think one useful um, analogy is that perhaps um, this biochemical map, where we understand the genes and proteins and metabolites around SPR, um, is a lot like a map, right? It anchors us in space, and so we know what the related uh, proteins are, and so we have good ideas about how to complement or uh, give treatments in this case. Uh, in contrast, right, perhaps NGLY1 is a bit like this cloudy road, and, and we don't quite have our bearings on, on what the implications are of mutation in NGLY1. If we just run with this analogy for a second, the question is how do we build out the map of knowledge around NCLI1? Okay? And if we were to, to, to do that, and this is an exercise that many people, uh, NCLI1 researchers and patient families have gone down, right? So you might search for the term NCLI1 in PubMed and you would find something on the order of, of uh, 10 to a, a couple dozen different articles. That's fine. That's great. That's something on the order you can read uh, in 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 uh, a week or so. Uh, but then you want to start looking at things like lacrima. Okay. Well, then you have 164 PubMed articles. That's that's uh, a lot more. Um, if you want to look at PNGA, which is the least homolog uh, orthologue of um, NGLI1, where a lot of biochemistry had been done, then you're up to a few hundred different articles. And you can keep going on and on. Uh, NGLI1 is a, is a family, is a, NGLI1 um, deficiency is a disease in this family of diseases, uh, congenital disorders of glycosylation. You could look at these related biochemical pathways. You could look at other genes that interact. Um, again, this is the disorder of glycosylation. So you want to know everything you want to know about gly glycosylation. You can find many different articles that describe the, the various symptoms of NGLI1 deficiency. And not surprising to anybody who does biomedical research, um, pretty soon, you know, you're thinking that, um, you know, any of the 28 million articles that are indexed in PubMed could possibly be of relevance towards um, elucidating that map of NGLI1 deficiency, because we know that biology is essentially a, a highly interconnected web of, of um, entities and, and concepts. Um, so, so. This is, this is the challenge in terms of laying out the knowledge map around any particular disease or gene. Um, the, the biomedical literature is simply massive and it's growing quite quickly. 
Uh, there are now over 1.2 million new articles that are published every single year that corresponds to roughly one every 29 seconds or so. And so the idea that any of us are more individually reading the literature, right, just, just doesn't hold up. And so when we think about how we take advantage of all the knowledge, the biomedical information that is being generated by the community, and how do we put that in a format that would inform um, creating these, these roadmaps um, around in vitro one deficiency and, and other rare diseases, um, this is where you, you come to the idea that biomedical research really um, relies on effective knowledge management. So this is why um, we uh, are very interested in this idea of organizing knowledge. So you might imagine that this, this, this challenge of organizing everything there is to know um, about um, in biology uh, is one that requires the talents of many different people. And, and you're right, it, it, it is sort of a, um, a highly, um, many people could contribute to that from people in the text mining field to publishers, to funders, to the journal authors themselves, to bio curators. Uh, and so there's a lot of people that can contribute. Um, my lab's particular emphasis is on crowdsourcing. So we think this is a, a useful tool to also uh, bring to bear on this problem. Um, as, as Katya uh, introduced uh, in her introduction, uh, crowdsourcing is now uh, sufficiently mature that it gets a, its own uh, definition in the dictionary. Um, but I really like uh, describing crowdsourcing uh, by example. Uh, crowdsourcing really references this concept of the long tail. And the long tail is actually most easily explained by starting with its converse, which is what I'll call the short head. Okay, so um, the short head is the situation where you have a few number of contributors, each producing a lot of content. Uh, so for example, you could take newspapers. There are on the order of 1,000 to 1,500 daily newspapers in the United States, and each of them puts out a large amount of content. So that is indicative of the short head. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, where uh, you, we have blogs, and there are over 120 million blogs online now. Um, and I think very few, if any of those blogs, would produce as much content as a newspaper. Uh, but in aggregate, uh, the content that is produced by those blogs is quite substantial. Uh, perhaps even dwarfing the amount of content produced by the short head in this case. So this concept of the long tail is something that we see in many different scenarios. Uh, you can see that not just in the news, but you can see it for uh, in the video space. Uh, TV studios in Hollywood are an example of the short head. YouTube would be an example of the long tail. And you could apply that as well to things like product reviews and food reviews and uh, talent judging as well all having sort of long tail equivalents of, of um, sort of short head historical ways of doing things. So when you think about crowdsourcing, you think about the long tail, one of the most successful applications that we think about actually is in the area of developing an encyclopedia. Uh, so you think about um, Wikipedia as a crowdsource mechanism of developing uh, an encyclopedia in contrast to uh, traditional encyclopedias like Britannica. So I think everybody here is probably familiar with Wikipedia, uh, but just to emphasize, Wikipedia is not the product of paid uh, people who are writing these articles. Wikipedia is an, an encyclopedia that anybody can edit, and uh, it is really the product of the collaborative and cumulative edits of um, thousands uh, to tens of thousands to millions of individuals. So when we started this project that we now call the GeneWiki uh, back in 2007 or so, so Wikipedia was started in early 2000s, um, by uh, the 2007 or so, 2006, 2007, uh, we and many people were thinking about how we could apply wikis to 
biomedical research. And uh, within this four month span uh, in 2008, there were three initiatives published uh, on that all sought to use this concept of, wiki, uh, of wikis to better describe the functions of human genes and protein. Uh, one was called Wiki Proteins, uh, the first one in May. Uh, our initiative was the Gene Wiki uh, in July, and then in August came out Wiki Genes. Uh, all uh, similarly and perhaps confusingly uh, named, uh, but all had the same basic idea of applying crowdsourcing to organize uh, gene function. Uh, I would say, I, I will note that, that these were all independent efforts. We, we, I think, had no knowledge of each other prior to these publications coming out. Um, so, so I'll talk more about this initiative, because this is the one that we have been most closely involved in. Um, and I'll say that we did our wiki initiative directly in the context of Wikipedia. Uh, that's in contrast to these two initiatives up here, which generated standalone wikis that were their own websites. So from the Gene Wiki perspective, right, many of you probably recognize this is being a, a Wikipedia page. Uh, this is the Wikipedia page uh, in about 2008 that described a gene called ITK. And what we did in the context of the Gene Wiki product, uh, project was to simply take lots of knowledge that we could um, uh, integrate from many different community databases, um, looking at things like protein structure and gene ontology annotations and protein interactions. Um, and we simply reformatted that and repackaged that, and we put that into Wikipedia. Um, so at the time, um, we actually did this for about 10,000 uh, different human genes. And we could write a computer program or a bot to do that process because this is something that we could just do in parallel uh, programmatically. Um, and <clears throat> the motivation behind this was really um, uh, to uh, solicit what I refer to as this positive feedback loop. The idea is that by creating a Wikipedia page for every human gene, we are uh, adding a, a little tiny bit of utility that is useful to people in the community because we've integrated data from many different resources and we put it in one place in a, in a format that's easy to read. And the idea is that by creating that little bit of utility, over time, there will be some number of people who will find that to be useful. So the Wikipedia page will get some number of users over time. And then some proportion of those users, it could be a very small proportion, but nevertheless, some proportion of those users will actually stay to make an edit and become a contributor. And that contribution could be as trivial as fixing a typo, or it could be as substantial as summarizing a recent paper in the literature. But in the context of making that contribution, then they make that page that much more useful, which in turn uh, draws more users and draws more contributors and so on and so forth. So the idea is that um, we want to initiate this positive feedback loop. And I think this positive feedback loop is, is quite characteristic of, um, of crowdsourcing applications in general. So within our GeneWiki initiative, I think this ended up being quite successful. The GeneWiki in aggregate gets viewed, uh, the pages in the GeneWiki uh, get viewed uh, four to five million uh, times per month, and uh, it gets edited uh, over a thousand times per month as well. So um, that was uh, the Gene Wiki initiative uh, sort of up until uh, maybe five or, or six years ago. Um, and, and I'll just say that this is sort of one representative page that I like to hold up. Much of this work actually predated our involvement. But nevertheless, it's, a, it's this Wikipedia page on this protein called Relin goes on and on, and it talks about many aspects of Relin, the biochemistry, the genetics, the mouse models, the relevance to human disease, and so on and so forth. And then um, I'll, I'll just highlight one particular snippet out of the, the Wikipedia page for Relin. It talked about this, uh, um, this fact here, that the expression of Relin has been found to be significantly lower in schizophrenia and psychotic bipolar disorder. And that in itself is a, is a useful bit of knowledge 
it's great um, that people can can read that. But what we noticed, um, we being information scientists uh, and bioinformaticians, is that that's easy for humans to read, but actually hard for computers to read. Right? There's no way for me to query Wikipedia to say, oh, well, give me all proteins that are found to be significantly lower in schizophrenia. Right? To do that, you sort of have to go through and read all 10,000 pages in uh, the gene wiki. Uh, but really what you want to do is you want to have all this knowledge in a database because databases allow you to do queries. So uh, that was when about six years ago, um, actually there was an initiative called Wikidata that was, in, uh, was uh, initiated. Wikidata is a sister project to Wikipedia, uh, managed by the same Wikimedia Foundation. And uh, Denny Vendercheck, who was the, um, the founder of Wikidata, had this mission statement. It was to provide a database of the world's knowledge that anyone could edit. Okay, so same sort of scope as Wikipedia, but we wanted to um, uh, put that in a database form. And once we saw Wikidata come online, uh, we being sort of the, the people um, trying to, to steer the Gene Wiki initiative, uh, wanted to commandeer uh, this initiative a little bit and really um, uh, build up the biomedical corner of Wikidata in the same way that we build up the biomedical corner of Wikipedia and build uh, a biomedical knowledge base that anyone could add. And so that's where we got into Wikidata being another initiative for crowdsourcing, but this time instead of crowdsourcing an encyclopedia, we're crowdsourcing a database. Uh, this is the corresponding page for that protein relin. Uh, that's small font, so let me just try to highlight the important bits. Uh, everything in Wikidata can be boiled down into what's called the triple. So the subject of the triple is relin. Relin physically interacts with um, VLDL receptor. Relin interacts with amyloid beta A4. Uh, relin regulates neural development. Um, that is essentially, uh, those are the subject object predicate relationships that define Wikidata and that can be easily represented in a database. Um, importantly, right, what I'm showing you here is the Wikipedia, uh, sorry, the Wikidata page for, uh, you know, the, the web page for Wikidata's Relin uh, page. But importantly, oh, sorry, I should say that, that each one of these concepts has unique identifiers behind it. So it's not just free text, we're talking about identifiers that can be unambiguously identified. Uh, and also, in addition to just having a web page, there's a programmatic access to, to behind this as well. So I could extract um, all of those same statements um, from the computer readable version of that web page. This is a, a, a JSON formatted API for people who are familiar with that. Um, but essentially, it allows then information scientists to easily access that knowledge as well. And so, uh, as I alluded to before, and then, then Wikidata can now represent that fact of Relin has decreased expression in schizophrenia according to this PubMed reference and according to that determination method, uh, can represent that fact that was in Wikipedia, but hard to access, we can represent that same fact here in Wikidata in a way that can be easily queried and computed on. Okay, so again, um, the mission was to see Wikidata with biomedical knowledge. And uh, to date, we, we have a, a large amount of data on human and mouse genes and proteins, on gene ontology terms, on drugs, diseases, microbes, and so on and so forth. And um, actually, uh, this is a, a, a network that sort of tries to summarize a lot of the knowledge that we've added. And let me just zoom in on this uh, uh, a little bit. Uh, I'll start over here in the, in the upper right hand corner. And this just says that uh, these are the genes that we've loaded. Okay, we've loaded information on roughly 500,000 genes, again, from human, mouse, rats, and many microbes. And, um, and these are all the properties that we have on those genes, all the, the, the bits of information that we can use to describe the genes. 
We also have the relationships between genes and diseases. So we uh, loaded the disease ontology, which uh, has categorized and, and classified uh, several thousand diseases. And we have the relationships between genes and diseases. We have the relationships between these diseases and uh, 150,000 chemical compounds. Uh, those chemical compounds can be related back to the genes by um, the, um, the uh, drugs targeting uh, the gene products. Um, uh, those chemical compounds in turn can be related to pharmaceutical products. Um, back over here, we can say genes are related to proteins, proteins are related to binding sites, protein families, and things like this, right? So everything in orange here are things that we loaded into Wikidata as part of our initiative. Uh, what, what I think is interesting, or what we found really nice, is that at, in the process of doing this work, uh, we got in contact with other groups that were interested in adding their data uh, and building um, additional ideas into this giant graph. So um, there was a group that was looking at human genetic variants. And so now we have information linking genetic variants and diseases and drugs, for example. And uh, we also had people interested in loading information on biological pathways. And these were things that um, once we got in touch, then we can co coordinate together and continue to build out this biomedical network. In addition, we had a few um, uh, examples shown in green down here, where these are initiatives that you know just all of a sudden showed up one day. These were completely uncoordinated with our initiative. So information on chemical hazards. This was actually from a group at the, uh, the CDC um, and scientific articles. So looking at how um, uh, the referencing behind many of these statements. And so the idea is that Wikidata, oops, being a crowdsourcing project can, over time and through collaborative and uncoordinated work by the entire community can continue to flush out this biomedical network uh, and um, in, in really productive ways. I'm not showing um, the query interface and, and the ways we can actually query this, this graph of knowledge, but um, it's ended up being quite a, a useful knowledge base of information to construct the types of, of knowledge maps, uh, again, that I alluded to before in the rare disease scenario. Okay, so I wanna wrap up the gene wiki side of things just with, with, with a few lessons learned uh, for people who are thinking about uh, perhaps um, uh, pursuing a strategy like the one we, we, we've taken here with the gene wiki. So the first one uh, is actually uh, that crowdsourcing oftentimes requires a, a, a fair bit of patience. Um, we, uh, you know, crowdsourcing, uh, especially in Wikipedia and Wikipedia and uh, Wikidata, operate on this idea of community consensus um, because we don't control. We, we are, have no special sort of administrative privileges in the Wikipedia and Wikidata sphere. So. Everything we do has to be done by consensus with the community. And what is obvious to us as bioinformaticians and genetics uh, researchers may not be obvious to everyone. So overall, right, working in the context of these community resources requires uh, perhaps more discussion and more um, explaining of the rationale than one might otherwise uh, think about uh, or have to do in, in other types of um, uh, projects that don't involve crowdsourcing. So first one is, is, is patience. Uh, the second piece is uh, providing value to your audience, right? And this comes back to the positive feedback loop that I mentioned, is that uh, you want to provide value to your audience because if you focus too much on what you want to get out of crowdsourcing, um, then uh, it's not a partnership that will bring crowds together. So providing value to the audience is important. And again, in, in our case, what we did is we did a lot of data integration that would be of value to people in the community. Once you've established that audience, um, I think crowdsourcing works well when you make it easy for those consumers of content to then become contributors. 
um, how do you turn your, your consumers into contributors? And, and I think the key thing there is, uh, or one key thing there is really enabling and encouraging um, contributions of many different types and of many different sizes. So again, I mentioned that contributors could just be fixing typo. And you know what, that's great because all of those small units of work, all those small contributions actually cumulatively uh, become a large uh, uh, set of contributions. Uh, things like adding references or, or creating figures, all sort of very useful uh, bits of work. And I think the key thing, another key aspect of this is that you know people who start out as small contributors or contributors with small amounts of context, uh, content develop into people who uh, then end up contributing large amounts of content. Okay, and the last lesson I'll, I'll, I'll say here is that um, we found it really productive to leverage existing communities. Um, uh, this idea uh, that was very popular with wikis, uh, you know, revolved around the idea of if you build it, they will come. Right, and so I mentioned two of the other wiki-based initiatives where they built a wiki and they thought, okay, once we build this, oh, people are gonna love this and, and, and they'll come. But you know what? Building community is actually really, really hard. And so our strategy with Wikipedia and Wikidata has always been to embed our efforts within existing communities. And for us, that has been uh, a really successful um, uh, principle. Okay, so, um, this idea of communities, of leveraging communities, actually segues into the second half of the talk uh, about citizen science. Uh, because when we think about communities that, um, are, that already exist, um, we thought about communities like this. Uh, now, this is from a rare disease day symposium uh, that was held in San Diego actually earlier this year. It was focused on um, CDG, which are congenital disorders of glyphosylation, and uh, NY1 deficiency, the disorder uh, in case study number two I, I opened with. And this was a, a, a fantastic day long, a two day symposium uh, that involved uh, patients and their families and caregivers, uh, clinicians and researchers. So it was really a broad cross section of people who came together, right, to really. Um, share notes and think about the important issues that uh, affect uh, the rare disease community at large and these specific rare diseases as well. So what is there to know about rare diseases? Rare diseases are defined um, by uh, the somewhat arbitrary definition of uh, affecting fewer than 200,000 patients in the United States. Uh, so, you know, less than 1% uh, of people. Um, even though rare diseases individually are quite rare, uh, again, in aggregate, they are uh, quite, quite substantial. So in aggregate, there are 30 million people who are uh, affected by one rare disease or another in the U.S., so roughly 10% uh, of the, the U.S. population. So. Um, so when we think about the rare disease community, right, this led us into the idea of this might be a useful, uh, or a community that would be open to this idea of citizen science. So, so what is citizen science? Uh, in contrast to um, uh, the crowdsourcing we uh, described previously, citizen science is really this concept of, of building focused platforms um, for people to contribute scientifically uh, to a common goal. And importantly, the contributors shouldn't be required to have any special education or prior training. Um, that's what characterizes citizen science. Now, citizen science itself has a long history. Um, I'm, I'm gonna highlight here several sort of uh, other initiatives in the citizen science community. Uh, the one of the oldest initiatives in online citizen science was actually the Galaxy Zoo initiative, where people could go and classify uh, galaxies from various sky surveys uh, in terms of how big they are and whether 
what shape they were and how many arms they had and what colors were they using. Um, this was a, a long-standing initiative um, now running uh, in this, uh, 15 years or so now. Uh, Fold it is an initiative to look at protein folding using citizen science. How do we get crowds to understand how proteins fold? Uh, iWire is a, a game to uh, um, map the three-dimensional structures of neurons to uh, what you see in that screenshot. In the lower left, we have two essentially these stalls in uh, little videos of these um, of, of brain uh, tissue. So um, these are some of the most successful citizen science, online citizen science applications to date. And I think uh, what you realize is that they have one thing in common, and that is that they all leverage um, citizen scientists' visual capabilities. Uh, and that makes sense from a citizen science perspective, because vision is a nearly universal human skill. And this I, and, and it's also a skill that far or human abilities far exceed computer skills. Okay, so our ability to recognize patterns and to do 3D spatial recognition, these are all things that humans do quite well. Um, so vision has been a focus of citizen science up to date, uh, to, to date. But we, in our initiative, and when we think about biomedical knowledge management, think that those same characteristics actually apply to another human skill. And that skill is the ability to read and understand language, right? Again, it is a nearly universal skill, something that we learn uh, when we start out very young. It's something we can do at a high level until uh, we're, we're, we're very old. Um, so it's a universal skill, and it also is true that human abilities right now far exceed uh, uh, computer abilities. Right? So we thought this was a nice um, um, uh, idea to leverage citizen science in the sphere of um, knowledge management. So when we think about how we might deploy citizen scientists or how we might engage citizen scientists, citizen scientists in this task. Um, we, we think about how uh, the, this field that is referred to as information extraction. Okay, and so how do we extract knowledge? Extracting knowledge uh, is to identify the concepts in text. So imagine, uh, I'm showing a snippet here for a biomedical abstract. Um, the first step would be identify, you know, what what concepts does this article talk about? Well, we could highlight uh, the various diseases in this um, article, highlight the genes, highlight the variants, highlight the drugs. Um, so we want to identify, you know, what are these articles about? The second step in information extraction would be to identify the relationships between those concepts. So we would want to know that there's a disease called familial systemic mastocytosis, and uh, it's mutation in this protein called KIT that actually causes this disease. And KIT uh, specifically has a mutation called K509i, and K509i is the specific cause of familial systemic mastocytosis. There's various drugs that actually can be used to treat this disease, and they act because they inhibit this, uh, this gene uh, KIT. So this is sort of the idea behind uh, the two-step process that we wanted to uh, see if our citizen scientists perform. So we started with the first task in this two-step information extraction process, and that's to identify biomedical concepts in text. Uh, in text. Uh, we, we wanted to know, could non-scientists collectively perform this concept of recognition um, at a level that, at high accuracy? And to do this, we leverage a platform called Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, I won't go into too much detail on what this is, but just to say that this is a way to pay people to do tasks for you, sort of like a, um, uh, a paid marketplace for performing uh, small tasks. And so we leveraged uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk to uh, do um, this concept recognition task. 
And we started with a gold standard that had been previously done by experts, where they took 593 PubMed abstracts, and those experts in those abstracts identified um, almost 7,000 mentions of disease concepts. And they had a, a, a long set of rules on what that meant. Uh, and if you give that task to uh, not uh, to professional scientists, they do this at an accuracy uh, where there's an F score of 0.87. Uh, the details of the F score are important just to know that the F score runs from zero to one, where one is very good at high accuracy, uh, perfect accuracy, zero is uh, poor accuracy. So that's what happens when you give it to experts. Uh, what we learned from our Amazon mechanical experiment is that if you give a non-scientist that same task, you give them a little bit of money and you ask them to do it, they get an F score of 0.78, which is substantially lower than what the expert does. And that's perhaps not surprising. But what's interesting is that instead of giving it to one non-scientist, you gave it to a small crowd of non-scientists and you essentially average their results. Uh, then you actually get up to an F score that's roughly equivalent to what uh, your paid, uh, to what your expert biocurator uh, did. And so we essentially replicated this gold standard that we started with uh, over this period of, of several days, engaging uh, almost 150 people for um, a pretty modest sum of money. So. This test that we did in Amazon and Mechanical Turk to us demonstrated that non-scientists were capable of performing this concept identification task. And the next question is that in addition to being capable of doing this task, would people be willing to do this task? Right? That's, that's the essential requirement for a citizen science application. So that's when we built this, uh, this uh, website, which we call Mark to Cure. And um, the, the main initiative initially was to, again, do the exact same experiment and replicate that gold standard. And what we found uh, is this, that um, we wanted to compare essentially paid crowdsourcing through Amazon Mechanical Turf, where the motivation is uh, a monetary one, and compare it to citizen science, where it's the same task, but again, we wanted to see if people would be willing to volunteer their time. And what we found is that essentially uh, they were. Uh, we saw a slight drop off in this F score, which we think is largely due to uh, essentially the instructions that we gave people. I mean, if we ran this experiment again with better instructions, I, I'm, I'm quite confident we could get uh, even matching um, performance there. It took us a little bit longer because in this first experiment, we had to organically grow our community. Um, and uh, but by and large, we considered this uh, a success. So up to this point, we showed that non-scientists were both capable of performing this concept recognition task, and they were willing to do this task um, uh, on a volunteer basis. And so, having I mean, said so it was those two things, now the question was, well, what are we going to ask our citizen science crowd to do? that would advance research. And this is where we get into this idea of mapping the biomedical network around NY1. And the idea is that we, we start with uh, all the concepts that are related to NY1, we could then get all the papers that are related to those uh, other concepts, and we could uh, ask our citizen scientists to do uh, information extraction on those papers, and we could continually grow this network of knowledge. So uh, with that mission, we rebranded uh, and reskinned our annual, uh, our Mark to Cure application to really focus around elucidating this network around NY1 deficiency, and um, and almost cut to uh, uh, the, the ending network or sort of the, the current roughly current network that we have. Um, this is the network around NY1 deficiency. NY1 deficiency is right there. NY1 is right there, uh, and this is the network that emerges out of annotating roughly 3,200 documents all around this idea of NY1 deficiency and its symptoms and its interactions and its pathways. Uh, this is the work of um, 1,300 computer, uh, contributors, um, almost a million uh, annotations. I think this that might even be old data, and we have both steps in the information extraction process. 
both concept recognition, this named entity recognition, as well as uh, anna explicitly annotating uh, relationships. So um, this is an ongoing uh, process. We are still uh, working. There's lots uh, more to be done in terms of the identifying our network. Uh, but uh, we think this is a, a, a pretty solid foundation for citizen science applied to information extraction on which to build. Uh, a, a few thoughts that relates to um, who is contributing to Mark Decure uh, and why. And this is the slide that I, I typically show uh, when I, I give this talk, and uh, it, it describes some of the motivation that people told us in the survey that we gave. Uh, but uh, here I actually uh, have the pleasure of, of having two Mark to Cure uh, contributors uh, having joined us uh, for this. And, and I thought maybe um, both Celine and Tom could, could give a couple minutes worth of, of thoughts uh, to tell us in their own words why, why they contribute to Mark to Cure. So with that, I'll turn it over first to, to Celine. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Celine. And um, I participated in Mark to Cure when I was a high school student. Um, I was looking for uh, volunteer opportunities in the biology and biomedical field online. And I saw that Mark to Cure was rec recruiting um, citizen scientists to help uh, with its project. So um, I saw the project and I thought it would be a fun opportunity. So I joined. and. Um, I learned a lot from the experience. Uh, first of all, I got the opportunity to read a lot of uh, biomedical research abstracts, and that helped me kind of familiarize uh, with this field better. And um, also the fact that um, the volunteering I did um, could contribute to curing a rare disease uh, was actually really exciting and that motivated me even more to continue volunteering for quite a long time. Fantastic, thank you, Celine. And Tom, in the room here with us. And, and I concur with what Celine just said. Uh, I was uh, myself looking for um, a, an interesting project to work on and, and uh, I was kind of motivated by uh, you know, just being able to contribute a little bit to uh, improving the state of the world and also uh, interested in, uh, in learning and keeping my uh, brain sharp. And, uh, you know, I, I found in uh, Mark to Cure and also in um, Stall catchers, which is the other uh, citizen science project that, that Andrew mentioned, that uh, there is certainly a learning process that goes on. It's kind of engaging and engrossing. Uh, and Andrew also talked about the, the 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 short head and the long tail, and what you observe a lot is that um, uh, people in citizen sciences in citizen science. Um, there are quite a few that are really enthusiastic. And then uh, after a period of time, some of them kind of um, uh, move away from it and, and follow other pursuits. So in implementing it, there's there's kind of this ongoing process of, uh, you know, recruiting new people and getting new people interested and relying and making use of the fact that you have a small core of people who are really enthusiastic and very productive. Uh, so uh, I'm real excited about um, uh, citizen science and, uh, and its future. Great. Thank you both, Celine and Tom. And they will both be here in case um, anybody in the audience has questions for them. I want to end uh, real quick on, on, again, some lessons learned uh, from my perspective on, on Mark to Cure. Uh, the first piece is uh, for citizen science was really essential for the success was is seeking the partnerships. Uh, this was a really uh, uh, between us, uh, the scientific, uh, you know, what we bring to the table is sort of the crowdsourcing expertise. And but we interfaced a lot with obviously the citizen science community that was essential, and as well as domain experts, right, the NGLI1 researchers. 
um, in our case, uh, Hudson Freeze, uh, who is also located here in San Diego. Uh, so those partnerships are really essential for anchoring us and, and making sure that we are both engaging to the citizen science community and useful for the research community. Um, secondly, I'll say that um, uh, there was a lot of trial and error in terms of um, building market here and building our citizen science site, uh, especially when we're going into a, a relatively new field of applying citizen science to language and information extraction. Uh, thankfully, we had a very forgiving and uh, you know, enthusiastic community that was willing to do that trial and error with us. Um, but uh, I think my, my, a lot of things just need to be empirically tested in terms of what works and what doesn't. Um, and, and there's no shortcut uh, beyond that that we found. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is uh, that we really have found um, encouraging communication has been really important. Um, you know, obviously we interact with our citizen scientists uh, through the contributions that they give to us through the citizen science site itself. Uh, but even beyond that, right, we, we, we paid a lot of attention to um, engaging our contributors in conversation and they gave us very useful feedback in terms of what made sense within the site and what didn't, what directions we can go and, and, and uh, that they would find engaging and things like that. So uh, communication even outside the formal citizen science um, application uh, turned out to be very useful for us. Okay, so that pretty much uh, wraps up my talk, except uh, to say uh, and acknowledge uh, the efforts of many, many, many people who uh, who contributed to both of these projects. Um, the people who primarily uh, contributed to uh, the GeneWiki project are outlined in green here. The people who are primarily contributed to the um, the Mark to Cure project are outlined in purple. Um, and a uh, fantastic team of engineers here um, at Scripps Research Institute, shown at the bottom here, as well as uh, many collaborators all across uh, the country. Uh, particular thanks to Ginger, who's here in the room here, who has really led the uh, Mark to Cure project for quite some time. And um, the Engly One families, um, um, the uh, Estenic family, the Leftwich family, and the Mite family, uh, who were enthusiastic participants in our Mark to Cure initiative. Uh, so with that, um, I will end there. And uh, I think, again, Celine, Tom, and I would, uh, as well as Ginger in the room as well, would, would all be happy to field any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This was great. And it was certainly uh, my first exposure to this type of project. So I think it's a great example, or actually great examples. Um, I don't see... Um, questions from the attendees yet. So let me, I actually have two for you. So for for Celine and Adam and Ginger, if I if I caught the name correctly, um, I, I wonder what's your advice for researchers who, who want to use this kind of approach of citizen science and, and set up a citizen science project? Maybe in a nutshell, what is your advice for them? I think first and foremost, we should determine whether or not it's appropriate because not every you know, thing that you want to get done is necessarily appropriately uh, or appropriate for citizen science. So that, I think, is the first question to ask. Okay, thank you. Once you sorry, what? Sorry, I just said okay, thank you. Go ahead. So once you determine if it's appropriate, then you have to actually dedicate resources to it because citizen scientists, as enthusiastic, and willing as they are to help, you need somebody to help guide them because there is a lot of learning that goes on both on the scientist side and the citizen scientist side. And this interaction is really important um, for making the project successful. I think you really have to have uh, a respect for the pool of people who are volunteering to help you out. And, and in designing a citizen science project, first of all, you have to think carefully as to whether or not uh, the, the particular task you're trying to address is something that can be done uh, just by a, a computer without uh, human intervention. In other words, uh, uh, 
uh, you want to, to, to make good use of the people to do things that only people can do as opposed to uh, just considering them as a, a pool of resource to do any kind of task. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I had a similar question for, for Andrew, just again, um, reflecting the researcher side. Again, because a lot of researchers that, that are thinking about doing a project like this, they're probably asking you, like, where should I start? And what would you say, Andrew? Like, what's the best way to start when, when someone is thinking about setting up a citizen's science project? I, I mean, I, I think, um, truthfully, um, not to be too 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 brutally practical, but I, I believe I actually think resourcing is important um, because there needs to be a. It's not something where you could, you know, set a citizen science site up, um, you know, over the course of a couple of weeks or even a couple of months, and expect it to succeed. Um, we. Um, it requires an ongoing commitment in terms of both the development and the outreach and the engagement. And so these are all important things. And it's so, so it's hard to, you know, for, um, I think the thing that we've learned is that, you know, it's great to have prototype sites that, um, that do the proof of concept, proofs of concept, but um, in order for citizen science sites to succeed, there needs to be sort of a, a substantial investment of funds, you know, essentially, uh, um, you know, grant money or, or foundation money or something like that. Um, right. The, the, so, bottom line, citizen science is not sort of a way to um, do research on a budget, right? I mean, it's, it's it's not a way to short circuit this idea. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get other people to do my work for me. Uh, it, it's a way of, of tapping into complementary expertise and one tool, but it, it but it's not a replacement um, for um, yeah. It's a, it's a complementary tool in your toolbox. Okay, I think this wraps it up nicely. So, thank you so much um, for all of your advice and insight on this. Um, I, I'm I could see a follow up. Um, webinar on just really the practical aspects of how many people do I need on the team to really do this and how do I really set this up. But this was a great introduction. So thank you again and thank you everyone for joining us.